we're so we're so glad that you you two have um, decided to join us, and I believe we are now live on Facebook. So, um, we thanks can... for inviting us, Cove. We're sorry we're not there. Uh -huh. I don't know where there is. Are you at Kent State? I am actually yes. I'm actually still on the Kent campus. Okay, um, which is interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually just buried a copy of the Constitution outside. Did you? Uh, Great. <laughs> it's still buried, I'm afraid. <laughs> true, true. You're not looking at the camera. That's what you have to try. Um, yeah, so maybe you guys could um, just do a little introduction. I'm sure most everyone is familiar with you, but um, for the people that aren't, maybe do a little introduction about who you are and what you do. Ah, my name is Bernadine Dorn. I uh, grew up in Chicago and Milwaukee. I uh, grew up with parents who were not political at all or who were voted Republican their whole lives. Nixon betrayed them, President Nixon betrayed them and they finally were uh, surprised and horrified. I, uh, was not a student activist when I was undergraduate. Uh, Bernie Sanders, though, led the first sit-in that I ever saw uh, at the University of Chicago. Oh, wow. Uh, kind of an odd footnote. Um, but I did argue for them. They divided the campus, polarized the campus. It was about the university owning segregated housing across the south side of Chicago, the University of Chicago. Uh, and so I uh, actually went to college First gen I'm first generation college in my family and I went to Miami of Ohio. So that was my first experience with Ohio uh, and it was not good. I transferred uh, luckily to the University of Chicago and um, then stayed and went to law school there. Graduated from law school, worked for the National Lawyers Guild uh, and then um, became a national officer of SDS in the summer of 1968, quite a year. Uh, traveled campuses, including Kent State that year. Okay, we're only in 1968. <laughs> uh, our life is good. We have uh, three sons. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five grandchildren. Uh, and uh, I've been lucky somehow to partner with Bill for the last 40 years? 50. 50 but years. who's counting? 50 years. <laughs> and we came back to Chicago and we're on the south side of Chicago, right near the University of Chicago. So that's uh, great. OK. Um, so if we want to start in 1968, um, the 1968 DNC protest, um, is like very infamous, I guess, depending on who you ask. Um, some people claim that y'all actually paved the way for Nixon's victory, which is an interesting take. Um, but I do wanna talk a little bit about that and kind of like the parallels between what was happening in 1968 and what's happening right now in 2020 um, with the presidential election and the complete like just alienation of young people from the Democratic Party, it's almost like history is repeating itself. Um, yeah, yes and no, of course. Uh, I'm gonna say only one word about it because I wasn't there. You'll find that a little bit odd and interesting, but I was. I had taken a delegation of students from SDS um, to Europe to meet with uh, the movement leaders in Italy, Germany, England, Spain and Yugoslavia. And uh, at the same time, the Soviet Union invaded um, Czechoslovakia where we were supposed to meet. We ended up meeting Yugoslavia and then traveling to German SDS and then to Sweden where the US deserters were. So I was not at the Democratic National Convention. We read okay. about it in the International Herald Tribune, but Bill was here on. Well, I mean, I was there, but I just say very quickly that the idea that um, the student movement caused Richard Nixon 
is like saying the civil rights movement caused George Wallace. I suppose yeah. there could be some argument made, but the problem with that line of thinking is that you end up saying anything you do that's progressive or that rise, that builds a movement is going to lead to the backlash. And so everyone should just be quiet and trust that they'll get out of Vietnam somehow without the mass movement pushing them to get out. And actually all history defies that idea. I, I don't think, I think we should be careful when we make causal claims like that. It's, it's number one, it's too simplistic. But number two, it leads down this road of saying that what caused Richard Nixon was somehow the left, when actually what caused Richard Nixon was the right. And George Wallace caused George, caused George Wallace and the Ku Klux Klan caused the Ku Klux Klan. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be smart about how we organize movements, but we should recognize fundamentally that it's mass movements, movements from below, fire from below, that causes fundamental change. It's not politicians with big hearts or good brains. It's actually when we build a movement on the ground that can, that can kind of create the conditions where new ideas, new imaginations can open up. And frankly, we're in that moment now, we're in a movement building moment where we have to push forward a progressive agenda out of this crisis. And we can't rely on the establishment to do it for us. You know, I think we absolutely agree. Um, yeah, I know a lot of young people recently have been taking flack for sort of this, this line that, you know, we don't want to support, you know, Biden as it is. You know, we would like to place demands on him to move him perhaps further to the left or, you know, build an independent movement. Um, but, you know, we've taken a lot of hits about that. Um, so maybe could you guys talk about, you know, movement building and sort of how you operated with SDS back in the late 60s? Well, we had, you know, we had quite a historical moment, but of course, your job is to name your historical moment right now. Um, our moment was, we thought, and I think to some extent it was true, though we exaggerated it, a turning point in American history where uh, the third world, what was called the third world movement at that point, that is to say, uh, South Asia, Africa, Latin America, <clears throat> the Philippines, and so on were uh, breaking free of their colonial histories and including US sphere of influence. And so there were, you know, there was tremendous uh, social upheaval from below around the world. And our gaze turned there as well as to the United States and its history of white supremacy and of capitulating uh, repeatedly to, you, to the US imperialism and to, and to white power uh, and to the suppression of people of color in the United States. So, you know, if you think about the things that happened starting in January of 1968 with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, kind of showing the world that the United States was not gonna win in Vietnam, no matter how long they stayed there. Uh, and no matter how much they bombed and napalmed and sent in, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of troops. So that kind of thing followed very quickly by uh, the assassination of Dr. King and a few months later, the assassination of Robert Kennedy uh, paved the way for that summer of 68. And it, it, so there were sh you know, shocks to the system, but it included the obvious fact that the US was denying that they were being defeated in Vietnam militarily, politically, and uh, culturally. Uh, defeated in Vietnam. And that was unacceptable, you know, to the American people. That's why the role of ROTC on campus there uh, was so important in a way, uh, having troops come in right, you know, as the United States announced, as Nixon announced he was invading Cambodia, having troops come onto a kind of quintessential Midwest American campus, uh, you know, captured the imagination of young people, but news people and, and the world really. Yeah, do you, do you remember where you were when you heard the news of Kent State? Yeah, because I, I read about it in the internet. In well, where was that? 1970. I don't remember where I was. I'd been there many times mm -hmm. in 68, 69, but in 1970 we were 
underground. We were fugitives yeah. and we were on the run. So I read about it. I was on the West Coast. We heard it on the news. We worried about all the people we knew who were there. Uh, and we followed it very closely in the mass media, really, or in, in the underground papers of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so from what I understand, um, Bill, you were like a regional traveler in Ohio. You had come to Kent State mm -hmm. a number of yeah, times. Was, Terry Robbins and I basically created the, um, the Michigan, Ohio region of Students for Democratic Society. And I, I want to go back, Cole, to the question you asked about movement building, because movement building, if we've learned one thing, we've learned that movement building involves um, certain <clears throat> irreplaceable steps, a certain irreplaceable rhythm. I will say that I think that, that whatever the 1960s was, and we could talk about it endlessly, although we really have a nostalgic bone in our body, but whatever it was, it was prelude to what we have to do today. It wasn't a thing in and of itself. There's no such thing as the 1960s. Nobody looked at their watch on December 31st and said, oh my God, it's almost over. Um, it, it isn't, we don't live that way. But I think we do understand that in order to build a movement, you have to redefine, you have to reframe the issues that we're facing. You have to reframe the issue of war and peace, for example, that, that the US military around the world is not a, a, a force for peace and democracy, it's a, pause, a force for violence and aggression. So reframing those issues is critical. And then connecting issues, war and warming, racism and scapegoating and, and imperialism. C creating a movement involves connecting those issues and understanding what's underneath it all. So for us, it involves, and it involved when we were organizing SDS in, in Michigan and Ohio, it involves, um, opening your eyes and seeing the crisis before you, understanding it as best you can, being astonished at both the beauty and the ecstasy all around us, as well as the unnecessary suffering, acting and then doubting. You have to do something and then you have to rethink. And I think to the extent that the weather people, you know, went, went down a, a tunnel that was really unproductive and really destructive in many ways, it was that we forgot that fourth step that after you act, you have to rethink, you have to say, what did we accomplish? Not how did I look out in the streets, but did we teach people, did we learn things? And if you can follow that rhythm, easy to state, difficult to, to uh, enact, then I think you're in the mode of building a movement, building a social movement. But one of the things that SDS had, I think right at that time, we were pressing SDS chapters around the country to, in 1968, 67, 68, to uh, look at the black student unions on their campus. And as you know, Kent had a, you know, black student, uh, I don't think it was called a union, black student. Uh, black United Students. Black United Students, exactly. Uh, uh, really, you know, the first such organization on the Kent campus because of segregation and the way state schools worked at that moment. Uh, and here was this first generation and they, they were active and they had an agenda and we pressed people to find out what their agenda was, press the white students in SDS and to figure out uh, how they can assist and what they could do. Um, one of the amazing things about the Kent story to me always is that the, the student union, uh, African American student union, uh, was in solidarity with what SDS was doing. And by the time the National Guard was moving onto campus, they left. And the, there's you know, graphic and astonishing pictures because they had a sense that they would be killed uh, once the National Guard it was in the hands of the governor and the mayor of Kent. And uh, they packed up and left and went to Cleveland. Um, but you know that relationship between student SDS chapters on campus and uh, their analysis of what the university was doing and was not doing is very important at figuring out how to move forward. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely important. We actually have partnered with um, Black United Students and um, nine other leftist organizations on the campus and we submitted a list of demands mm -hmm. to the university um, to, to you know, push for more progressive change on the campus. Good, good. good. 
that I think in 68 was the first time there was a significant more than one or two African American students on campus. So it was a generational uh, um, move, uh, you know, a move in which a certain generation started to go there to school. Yeah. Uh, maybe go back to Bill. Um, some people do, some people have requested in the Facebook chat that you talk a little bit about um, your time with Kent SDS and as a regional traveler. Um, you know, I was working with Terry Robbins, who was really focused on Kent. And um, there were several, and there was a, a robust chapter at Kent State. I went there with Terry a couple of times, but my, <clears throat> my work was mostly in Michigan. So we traveled together sometimes, but we also traveled apart. And I, I got to Kent a couple of times, and I know several of the people who were SDS activists there um, and admired them greatly. But that wasn't my main um, place that I was hanging out. I was hanging out at Michigan State and Ferris State up in, uh, up in Western Michigan and um, Wayne State in Detroit and the University of Michigan. Those were my main organizations. Yeah. We're not fans of uh, University of Michigan. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> Go blue. Bill tried to organize our, our sons to march around the table every Thanksgiving weekend. And sing the fight song. It didn't take, I have to say, despite his best efforts. <laughs> we couldn't get any of our sons to go there. But, um, but you know, I think, I, I just want to say that when I traveled there, maybe three or four times before uh, the shootings, uh, the killings, the assassination, the massacre uh, at Kent State. And, um, it, you know, they had a very robust and fascinating uh, SDS chapter. And they did a lot of work uh, at analyzing, you know, we, we used to call it who rules Columbia after the Columbia strike, where you really actually do a power structure analysis and see who's on the board of trustees, even of state universities and so-called public universities and who are the big donors and who are they really responding to and what does, how does a university work? What's allowed and what's not allowed? And they had done a great deal of work the students there um, to, to analyze and understand that. And I think, and to agitate about both the war and racism. And by the time the National Guard came onto campus uh, and the stage was set, they were, they had really organized a lot of people to uh, think about the world that they were inhabiting and, and to make analysis and to make sense about standing up and uh, taking a stand. All right, so speaking of the Kent um, SDS chapter, I just want to know this just because I'm a nosy person. Okay. So we've heard that the Kent SDS chapter was among like some of the maybe rowdier people at the 1969 SDS um, convention. <laughs> Is that true? What went down at that convention? because I love reading about it. I don't know whether to say that's a high bar or a low bar. <laughs> I wasn't rowdy at that convention. Um, you know, Kent State, Kent State had a big SDS chapter and they were militant and they were radical. And by radical, I mean they were people who understood that the fundamental contradiction in the United States is the contradiction of racism and white supremacy. And that's also manifested as imperialism, as you know, adventures abroad in which we, the country, you know, invades and occupies other countries. So they made those connections and- um, They studied, they read. Yeah. Some of, one or two of them, I think, came from uh, parents who had been activists, labor organizers and activists, but mostly not, mostly more like me, just opening their eyes and reading everything they could find to make sense of the world and figure out where their place was in it. So. Mm -hmm. But they were, they were very organized. I mean, they, you know, I, I remember thinking when I met the Ericsons and stayed at their house, I think the first time that I'd never seen, I traveled a lot, but I'd never seen a married couple with a real house as <laughs> part of an SDS chapter. So, you know, it, it had its particular particularities. But, and the women were also, you know, uppity and that was a that was a contradiction in SDS then at the time of course how much 
for the women, part of the chapter, part of deciding, speaking up, giving speeches, debating about what to do next. So that, that was also true. Wow. I did, um, I did want to talk a little bit about organizing as a woman, you know, no offense, like Colton Bill, but like girl talk right now, right. um, organizing a woman, especially during the sixties. I mean, it was like pretty, uh, it, women's concerns were, they seem to have been dismissed as like not important or not as important as this other thing, whether it be the war in Vietnam or it be any other issue that, um, people were organizing around and that still occurs today. I mean, as a woman, I still feel like I go into leftist spaces and I feel like women and like women's liberation and like women's revolutionary conscious in a patriarchal society is kind of just dismissed. And I don't know, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about your experience, like organizing or if you even just want to offer any advice i mean lots of women uh, are feeling this way of course i don't have advice except to be uppity and speak up and yeah. you know and have the guys sit down i mean when i started traveling for uh sds uh you know they were not used to seeing a woman come to town so to speak and i you know one of my regrets which i only understood really in retrospect was that I should have come to town and insisted on meeting with women in SDS first, first before the big meeting, instead of late at night after the big meeting. But you know, it would have been. I think it would have been a good strategy. Uh, but at the time, the women's movement was certainly uh, breaking out. I had been part of a women's circle, a women's group in New York the year before I started working with SDS. Um, it opened my mind to reading about women around the world and to the women's movement and from in you know radical women uh emma goldman and uh, rosa luxemburg and on and on so i i i had some consciousness but i also felt uh you know i, I was focused on the war and racism and i didn't know how to integrate them one of the wonderful things about i think young people today is that they have a at least my understanding is there's a much more fluid sense of uh, inter, uh, interconnectedness and uh, intersectionality as it's called. So you don't have to fight over which is more important and that's the one you're gonna do and not the other ones and you're gonna have to leave something behind. Obviously you can't do everything at the same time but you can analyze the world and understand that the gay movement, the climate, justice movement, uh, immigrant rights, uh, and in, as well as workers' rights, and, and that women are workers and immigrants and part of uh, the people suffering from uh, climate change. I, I think that, you know, intersectionality helps you fit the complexity of the world that we're in, in an analytical framework, uh, instead of in a competitive jousting match. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. make sense? Does that? Oh yeah, Does yeah. That... And like, if you want, it just feels like if you want to build a coalition and you're failing to like take into account like um, racism or like black national liberation or things like that, like your coalition fails. I mean, that's what caused the splinter in SDS, right? Was the fight over um, the right to self-determination? Yes, in part it was, it was certainly, uh... You know, it was a moment in 1969, 68, 69, in which we now know that the FBI and the CIA had a strategy to assassinate African American leaders, uh, radical leaders, uh, to disrupt and destroy their organizations by force and violence, and to uh, disrupt white organizations, uh, not by force and violence, but by continually arresting us and, and uh, and sending us to jail. So, you know, there was two strategies really, and it's right there in the in the Freedom of Information Act papers from counterintelligence program of the FBI. Uh, so they they were watching and trying to divide, and sometimes dividing was was effective. I mean, you know, we watched from a couple of blocks away, really. 
the FBI and the Chicago Police Department assassinate Fred Hampton, who's the head of the Black mm -hmm. Panther Party of Illinois. So it, it was happening, so to speak, under our eyes and, and with people that we knew and were in some kind of uh, coalition with. Yeah, so maybe we could move a little bit towards the present time. Um, there was recently a letter put out by some former SDS people. Um, oh my God. I want to talk about the letter so bad. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I feel like a lot of young people were kind of let down um, with, with this letter because, it, I mean, a lot of these you know, new left activists that people look up to and think, you know, they, they did something to change the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, released this letter that had no no struggle in it at all, unconditional support. Um, you it, know, it just seems like not to get on my soapbox right now, but it is like very frustrating to be like that letter was insulting and it was condescending, and no, no kidding, yes, it was. You yes, talk about Fred Hampton getting murdered in his bed um you know the police and the u.s government were collaborating to murder or like other eyes in prison prominent left leaders especially black panthers especially black activists some of whom are still locked up today as we know and, and the these people's no. lives were ruined because and it seems that the people who wrote this letter were the ones that were standing, wringing their hands, saying, oh no, this is so terrible. And then they just kind of slinked off into the seventies and became like, I don't know, heads of PhD programs at Columbia, off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't know who you mean. <laughs> you know, here's the thing, I, you know, I just, many of the people who signed the letter are old friends and even still current friends. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I have a range of, uh, relationships with them. Some of them remained activists their whole lives still. Uh, mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, not and are kind of to the almost to the right of the Democratic Party. So and, or see their job as suppressing uh, the left and, milit and any militancy or any mm -hmm. uh, radical organizing of any kind. So there's quite a range of people in that old group. And I'm, I'm still standing with uh, the people who are still activists in that. Um, of whom there's many, but the letter was condescending and horrible. I totally agree with you. And it really revealed, I think, the fact that many of those people are not working with, we, we had the luxury of being in Chicago where there's so much youth activism and so many uh, sophisticated and complex uh, organizing networks around multiple issues. And so, you know, it's been kind of a joy to be uh, educated by them to let when they let us uh, run with them you know we're not uh, by any means teaching them they're you know they are uh, self-organizing and learning from their own mistakes in a pretty coherent and wonderful way so uh, I you know I understand you're uh, being appalled by the letter by the tone by the notion that these folks are, are wagging their finger at, at young activists today. And I can't think of any young people who would even know who they were, let alone uh, take the letter seriously. So uh, it was depressing to say the least. And Colt, it's not just that there was no struggle, it's that um, there was no sense that there's actually movements on the ground going on right now. Yeah. And people are organizing, people are building movements. There's a burgeoning anti-war presence. There's an anti-chauvinist anti, um, movement, you know, undocumented and unafraid. Black Youth Project 100, Black Lives Matter. These things are happening and an environmental movement that is, you know, really propulsive and really taking off. And so the idea that somehow you're gonna sit there and say, listen, everybody hurry up and get behind Joe Biden. It betrays so many things. And to call it a letter from the new left and have to be signed by all white people yeah. is a little weird. Um, but but the, the, the reality is, if you want to talk about movement building and, and real social change, you have to build movements on the ground. You have to mobilize masses of people. 
in the workplace, in the neighborhoods, in the communities, in the schools, in the places of worship. And yes, there's a place for real politics, but the real politics, the-, the Electoral know, politics, you mean. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, entering that political arena is reasonable at some point, but it doesn't make any sense without a movement on the ground. And again, a quick look at history will tell you that Lyndon Johnson did not lead the civil rights movement. He was a cracker from Texas who responded to the civil rights movement passing the most significant civil rights legislation since reconstruction. Franklin Roosevelt was not part of the labor movement. He responded to the labor movement. And Lincoln, if you read his first inaugural address, it's genuflecting in front of the slave owners. What changed Lincoln by the second inaugural address was the abolitionist movement and black, pe black people's enslaved workers freeing themselves. That's the energy, that's the engine that drives change. And if you're not willing to work in that, you're spending too much time looking at the sites of power you have no access to, you're making a, a first rate error. Oh, I definitely, if we wanna like get into like that, any like social reform in this country was not like, because the government had this like goodwill towards the people. They were like, oh, we'll give them, you know, exactly. get, get, let's let them, you know, not work 20 hours a day because we're just, you know, such good people. It's yeah. because, um, you know, quelling working class anger so they don't revolt is their priority. And that just kind of highlights the, I would say like a dire need for people, young people. I'm like 23, I feel old, but I guess I'm still young of just organizing outside the confines of electoralism because electoralism has proven time and time again, it doesn't work. People had such high hopes for Obama. You know, they were like, Obama's gonna be the first grassroots community organizer president. That was a sham, we know now. And you have, you know, Bernie Sanders, who was a very promising uh, candidate who was actually bringing about Sorry, I'm like looking out a window and a bird just flew by and it was like really <laughs> I'm just, I apologize, but bird um, is funny to you. <laughs> but Bernie Sanders was bringing this huge, massive movement of young people and he was like just swatted away, like you know, like the the electoral politicians coalesced behind arguably like the weakest candidate the Democrats could run exactly. and exactly. stopped him. That just proves that electoralism and like uh, this electoral power structure transforming it or trying to transform it is just futile. Well, look, imagine that Bernie Sanders got the nomination. The fact is that if you had that kind of politics that said, Bernie will solve it for us, you're missing the point about what movements do, about what social movements do. You always need to mobilize people on the ground. There always needs to be an active um, social movement churning along. Otherwise, power is constrained in so many ways and the establishment has so many ways of diffusing and, and hiding the way that it uses power. So the point is not to find the greatest candidate and run that person. The point is to pay attention to the sites of power you have access to the university, the school, the classroom, the house of worship, the workplace, the neighborhood, pay attention to that because if we mobilize that, then we'll be in a position to say, for example, we want universal health care. We demand universal health care. We're not waiting for somebody to give it to us. We're not picking the, the finest person who will do the work for us. We have to do the work ourselves. And if we don't, then we're missing the, the relationship between what I'm calling real politics, but I'm calling mass mobilization and kind of um, what else is going on. I mean, I think you have to give it to Bernie for organ organizing, you know, relentlessly for the last 10 years uh, and, and, you know, kind of uh, capturing the imagination of uh, a lot of young people as a different voice, as not a, nor not a traditional politician. Um, and so, you know, you could say, and I think it's true that they were, the establishment was never going to get, let him have the nomination mm -mm. Uh, with this kind of uh, president, you know, who was so unpopular and so hated. So they feel that they can have a cakewalk with the safe 
uh, politician. Uh, we'll see how, how it turns out. But I think, uh, you know, I, I just want to take my hat off, I guess, to the, to the people who were swept up in the Bernie movement and hope that they become, stay and become radical organizers. Yeah, but, um, but, but the Bernie movement did something that we talked about earlier. You have to change the frame. So until the Bernie movement right. got, some, got some legs, healthcare as a predatory capitalist undertaking was assumed to be just normal. We have this ridiculous system of non-healthcare unless you're wealthy or, or have a certain kind of job. And, and so the Bernie campaign, the Bernie movement changed the frame. We need to change the frame on so many other things, militarism, environment and so on and it is being changed and but I think so let's Bernie, give him credit for I, that i am giving him that's what i'm saying yeah. let's give him credit for that but also for growing in the last year yeah. and realizing that he had you know built and generated a white movement that he had a lot of work to do and a lot to learn about racism and the way in which that's tied into the capitalist system that we have and i think he, he i think he grew as well as the movement grew as the as the campaign went on so We'll see. I hope it has continues to have to evolve and have legs. But you know, let me add one thing, which is that too often we act as if elections are selecting a perfect person who will do things for us. The reality is there are no perfect people and power mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. So rather than think of it that way, think of elections as a tactic. It's not a principle. You don't have to have a perfect person to vote for. It's a tactic. At the, what, what is principled is that we have to be organizing and mobilizing from below. The fire from below is our job. And we should certainly tactically figure out who do we vote for so that our mo mobilizing, our organizing can be more effective, can have more chance to succeed. So you're saying voting is the tactic and you, voting it's is only going to take you know, an hour. Oh, unless, you're, unless you're in Wisconsin, two minutes. But you know, basically, you can do that. You should do that. That's good. And I think also, I just want to distinguish this from local politics because sometimes in local politics, there's great radical organizing going on. In fact, in most cities right yeah. now, there is. And so, you know, I think that it's worth saying not not that big city mayors are, or governors are the be all and end all, but on the ground. There are people pushing them, uh, you know, radical organizing and radical organizations pushing them and challenging them and forcing them to take stands that they didn't really uh, expect to take or even want to take. Yeah. Yeah. So with that sentiment of this this grassroots organizing, um, maybe can we talk about did this did coalition building in the set in the sixties and seventies work? And you know, maybe how how could we as young people avoid maybe some of the pitfalls um, that some past movements have taken. <laughs> Give me advice. I want you to tell us. <laughs> Again, I think, I think what we learned, for example, I'll just give you one example. Working with the, the social political movements in Chicago, we, they have learned something from the mistakes of the past. And one of the things they've learned is not to have, not to put forward charismatic male leaders. They think that, that leadership should be horizontal. And it's not that it's leaderless movements, it's leaderful movements. And I, I, we learned so much from watching them organize horizontally. And what Bernie was saying earlier about intersectionality, the people we work with always say, we're organizing, lo looking at our organizing work through a black queer feminist lens. What a great way to say it. They're not saying these are divided things, they're saying, the, I'm not one thing or another, I'm many things. And the lens that I wanna to use to examine the social situation is a black queer feminist lens. That helps us to stay oriented, to stay true to, to the goals. And they have built you know, a series of coalitions in Chicago with uh, different racial ethnic groups, but also with different unions and or, uh, teachers, Chicago Teachers Union, a great radical union that we have the pleasure of uh, watching work in this time. Um, you know, so they have, they meet, they uh, came up with a 10 point program, hammered it out, took thousands of hours of meetings to hammer it out. And, and so they feel connected to each other and they show up at each other's events. Yeah. That, that makes a huge difference in how you feel and how you 
think and who you're accountable to. It's so great to show up at an environmental rally and have the Black Lives Matter kids show up and have the Chicago Teachers Union show up. That doesn't happen automatically. That happens because 38 organizations get together and decide to meet twice a month and hammer out a common agenda and listen to each other. And it takes real work. It's not something that just Right, so the, when the Chicago Teachers Union went on strike this fall, for example, Perfect. everybody showed up downtown and it was just huge demonstrations uh, that they called every day. And really the city, the new mayor and the city here figured it out with the Chicago Teachers Union and school opened. But and you know, you know the, that the, wouldn't have happened without the kind of really grassroots mass support of parents, students, teachers, and and everybody else who was organizing. And city. it wasn't just the rallies downtown. I was picketing at our local high school every right. morning, and there were vets picketing. There were vets picketing at the high school. They weren't teachers demanding something. They were from the anti-war veterans movement, and they were part of it. Why were they part of it? Because we see that the exploitation and oppression of teachers, the, the, the hollowing out of public education also is linked to war, is also linked to racism, it's also linked to gender discrimination and so on. The bus drivers union also was in solidarity with yep. the teacher strike. So that, you know, you, it, it's- uh, Takes work. Takes work, a lot of work, but we're very lucky to see when it's good, it's good. Yeah, with our um, with our coalition that we built on campus, it was hard and it's still hard work. And we went the entire semester and we looked back and people brought up issues and grievances that they had. And it's just a lot of like meeting with people and just talking and learning and listening and understanding your history and going back over things that didn't work. It's very time consuming, but I think you want to add, and I'm sure you did in your practice, want to add, you know, that you have to act because if you act together, you also have a lot more to unpack together and analyze and see yeah. what didn't work. Unpacking, understanding, self-criticizing, accepting criticism from other people, which is something I have issues with, as <laughs> many people watching probably know. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you can't, you can't get anything accomplished if you don't build this coalition, this mass coalition. I mean, in the 70s, like the Rainbow Coalition is like, I still look back and like in 2020, I'm like, that's incredible. That's an incredible thing that people did. Right, um, and that would not have happened really without the Panthers. That was their uh, idea. And it was the idea that, you know, you, you could, uh, you needed the support of Latinos and Puerto Ricans and poor whites from Appalachia who were now in an area called Uptown in Chicago. In other words, if you were gonna have grassroots community support uh, and, and you needed that kind of coalition and they spent a lot of time and energy building that. And every, you know, it, it was beautiful and very time consuming as you point out. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we recently submitted a, a, a list, a series of demands to the university for demands. Um, and you know, we did our best to try to represent, um, you know, the broad issues that students face. And I think the biggest one was, um, we have a corporation called Aramark as our dining service providers. Yep. Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with, but they run a number of private prisons and um, they, they're not paying student workers a livable wage. And it's just horrendous, you know, we don't think that, um, a university should be a moral institution and it should not be partnering with people that are profiting off the incarceration. A, a university that prides itself so much on its progressive and welcoming, you know, environment that they cultivate. Right. So is Aramark a big contributor or on the board of trustees or what, what's their relationship to Kansas State? They're, they're a pretty large contributor. Um, I know they, they gave the university um, a pretty sizable loan, from what I understand, as a part of their deal. With their, with their contract. Um, mm -hmm. yes. You know, there was a wonderful piece of work that when the students occupied Columbia in 1968, they, uh, they had done a work, a, a pamphlet called Who Rules Columbia? And they had analyzed, you know, the Rockefellers and the others who were on the board of trustees at the time. Uh, and, you know, it was such an expose of how universities that seemed to be 
just there for the students and just to provide a global uh, education and to uh, let you specialize and figure out who you are. That they actually have this other whole thing going on, this whole other agenda. It was it was shocking revelation at the time, and I think it's still important to keep doing it because, as you point out, uh, the forces at work in the university affect, uh, and that that's why they're there. They're, they affect, uh, you know, consciousness, how you think about the world, who's powerful, where you're going to work, what you're going to do, make with your life. Oh, and we um, we had like an incredible um, organization of student activists that were organizing the workers on campus. And um, we looked a little bit into like, who is giving Kent State money besides Aramark? And, you know, Department of Defense popped up, um, you know, Raytheon, oh. these sorts of like lovely companies that the university is for some reason receiving millions of dollars every year from. But they're the ones, you know, making the drones. They're the ones making the surveillance equipment. I think it's actually mostly, now that I'm thinking about it, mostly surveillance equipment that Kent is manufacturing. Someone, sure. someone at home Google that for me and let me know. But um, yeah, it's just like as students and as student activists, we do need to be aware of like our safety in the Imperial Corps is guaranteed for now. We are not the ones that are the victims of these drones that our university is uh, apparently researching in a basement somewhere. Right. But one day, you know, like these realities of like the late capitalist American empire, you know, like these realities are gonna come home sooner or later, like come home to roost, so to speak. Exactly. exactly. And, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, people looking at the university and, and kind of seeing who rules what, recently have, have, I think correctly, worried about the fact that Saudi Arabia has a whole strategy to fund chairs and fund departments in US universities and colleges. And Israel does, and Turkey does, and China does. But the thing you're pointing out, Shelby, is most important of all, the Department of Defense does. And if you just take, well, it's common sense, it's our Department of Defense. No, it is not. It's a time of, of military and imperial aggression around the world. We should be horrified that the Department of Defense is it wormed its way into every university, it's not just through ROTC, but through funding research programs and all the um, One of our friends, Victor, just pointed out in the chat, well, didn't just, but apparently Kent State University markets itself as the fourth most military-friendly campus in oh, the country. Oh, my God. should be ashamed. Which is fun. <laughs> that's fun. I want to know the first three. Yeah, that's actually interesting. I wonder where um, they got that. But yeah, Kent State is very, very complicit in. I mean, ROTC is still on campus. Like, they brought it back after it got burned down. Tell me the rest of your demands. You said four demands. Yeah. yeah? Uh, the first demand was return May 4 to the students. Um, recently, the planning for the May 4 commemoration was stolen away by a private body. Um, and the person they put in charge was, you know, oddly enough, a former CIA, um, you know, officer, as it is. The second demand was um, Aramark off campus. And the third demand was um, a student worker contract, a demand a living wage. Currently, all dining, the majority of students um, work for dining services and dining services is contracted directly through Aramark. So the university can say that we pay our student workers a living wage, but in reality, they're not paying the dining workers a living wage because they're not the ones paying them. Um, and then the final demand was um, protecting students' health and safety. Um, and it was sort of the broadest of the demands. Um, currently, mental health services on campus are you know, poorly maintained. Students are being put on um, month long waiting lists. Six months. Um, six months. Really? Mm -hmm. There's like eight, full, not to cut you off, Cole, but there's like eight full-time, as of last semester, eight full-time staff for the entire campus. A third of Kent's campus uses these resources. There are eight full-time people. But we're building another parking garage, apparently, so. <laughs> right. You yeah. know, the current crisis we're living through points out so many contradictions in, yeah. in our society. And it's up to folks like you and us to analyze and make sense of them for people. So the fact that 
the airlines are being bailed out at the billions of dollars and Wall Street's being bailed out. Where were we, why weren't we involved when they were making profits? You know, and why are we now using our, and the same is true at universities. I mean, what is the university for in a free and democratic society? And how is it doing in meeting the demands of a free and democratic society? I would say the contradiction is raw and available and we have to make sense of it. The fact that the, Dep that the Department of Defense owns so much of what goes on at Kent State and other universities is a cautionary tale. It's something we should organize around and demand to resist. Yeah, I mean, coronavirus has just kind of like stripped back like and revealed like this just like rotten, decaying institution that is capitalism in the United States. It's and I think yes, yes, and still is, and it's rolling. And it's both big and small, Shelby. You know, in Chicago, there's the Chicago Public Schools announced with great fanfare in February that they were going to put soap in the children's bathrooms. And you say, what? There was no soap in the children's bathrooms? And then Detroit announced they're going to stop shutting off water to poor people. And you're like, you monsters, what, what the hell is going on? And the shabby healthcare system we have, the, the hollowed out government, we need to make demands and we need to make them coherently and well. And, you know, uh, uh, over it all, I mean, everywhere we look, there's white supremacy, there's militarism, and there's catastrophic climate change, capitalist climate change. And we have to work on all of those in tandem. You're here. What? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, there's just, there's just so much happening, y'all. Isn't so it? much happening in the world. Where do we start? It's a great time to be alive. Well, we, we start need where you. we are. It's an interesting time I to be alive. Said, where do we start? We start wherever you are, and and then you build out from there. I mean, mm -hmm. what you know, when students say to me, when my students say to me, you know, there's so much. What do I do? I say, do anything. I mean, one it's thing. not it's start not you have to do thing. everything. Do something. And if your passion is queer rights, your passion is women's rights, international human rights, environmental collapse, um, war, white supremacy. Jump in there and then connect to the other movements and then we're on our way. That's what we have to do. We have to go out and meet strangers, organize people at the workplace, in the neighborhoods, and then we have to but connect to the other issues. that's what you've done, the two of you at Kent State. So that's what you'll do, you know, in two years when you're not at Kent State, right? Wherever you are, because, you know, you want to, you know, you'll probably want to commit yourself, you know, to a life of activism. and it's around you, so it's not hard to find. And you can't do everything, but you can do as, as you are doing. Something. You know, great yeah. set of demands, really a great set of demands. Terrific. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we've, we've run for about an hour here. So um, thank you so much for doing this. I don't know if there's anything final that you'd like to say or anything, but no, thank you so much for being able to do this with us. Thanks for reaching out. We really are glad to, sorry we're not there in person, but happy to meet you and happy to do this program with you. Keep rising, stay strong.